So last time we had us a nice little chat about high speed steel and how awesome of an option it is, especially for us home shop crowd. I mentioned that I'd slowly slipped into the seedy underworld of insert tooling, but still like to keep plenty of high speed steel on hand. It's kind of like my recommendation for the convenience store right down the street. I wholly endorse walking there. It's the healthy green option, but when I need to go, I usually drive. All right, go. I'm ready. Push. Anyway, in order to round out the big picture, I wanted to talk about carbide. I'll start off briefly with brazed carbide, but mostly share what I know about insert tooling. Not that I know a ton, but the little I wish someone would have shared with me when I was getting started. But we'll be looking mainly at insert tooling. In this case for the lathe, but by and large, this also goes for the mill. If you stick around, we'll talk about choosing tooling for your shop, what to look for, the most fun shapes and colors to get, what they do, where to get them, how they taste, and, most likely, plenty of completely unrelated stuff. To get us back on track, we're talking about tooling for our machines that we need to cut raw materials into scrap metal, into parts for our projects. We said a tool is any material harder than the material we'd like to cut, that's the right shape to do so efficiently. The last video was all about the aspects of what quote unquote right shape actually meant. And high speed steel is harder than just about any material we as hobbyists are likely to run into. Combined with the fact that it's cheap, it makes it an ideal cutting tool. In fact, in some cases, it's preferred over the carbide tooling we'll look at in a minute. But we had to cut the high speed steel to shape, and to do that, we needed something harder. In our case, it was a grinding wheel. In fact, to cut high-speed steel into shorter pieces, like the slotting tools I use in my shaper, you'd be likely to use an angle grinder with a cutoff wheel. Moving our way up the food chain in hardness brings us to carbide. As you saw in the beginning of this video, carbide is harder than high-speed steel, and therefore, properly shaped, can be used as a cutting tool. Now, this is just a carbide blank. You can buy them just the way you buy high-speed steel blanks. But usually you'd find carbide already in the form of a cutter. Here I've got some lathe inserts and a couple of small end mills. And that right there is probably the reason insert tooling draws such big crowds. They provide it already cut to shape. High speed steel is more than enough for what we need to do in the home shop, but it's on us to shape it. And for someone just coming out of the gate, I appreciate the appeal of that. A cutter that's already to shape and ready to go. But oh how many shapes there are. Okay, old Tony. Carbide is harder and comes in funny shapes. Who cares? I'll tell you who cares. Because it's so hard, it has the potential to move massive amounts of material very quickly. Though technically I think it might be more the temperature and wear resistance than the hardness, depending on the material you're up against. But what carbide can do in five minutes might take high speed steel half an hour. For some people, E period, G period manufacturers, how fast you can get her done is the name of the game. I know, I know. Weird name for a game. Unfortunately, carbide, just on its own, isn't magic. You need a machine with enough speed and horsepower to actually move the amount of material carbide is capable of moving. That takes us to point number one. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know how many points I have. Carbide wants to go fast. And that only gets worse the smaller your work is. If you're making screws for, I don't know, wristwatch, the carbide might want to see 10,000 RPMs. But for now, let's not have the details slow us down. Point number two. Carbide is brittle. It's hard, but it's not tough, in the technical sense of that word. Now, granted my info is a little bit dated, good carbide these days isn't as brittle as it used to be. But from our perspective, especially compared to high-speed steel, like in our lathe tools, drill bits, end mills, etc., it's brittle. The carbide we use is a matrix. It's a mixture, usually tungsten and carbide powders pressed into a shape, in a shape conducive to cutting metals. But they also press this stuff into other funny shapes, like armor-piercing rounds. But I'm getting off topic. Point number three. Because it's a pressed matrix of various stuff, except for some special cases, carbide isn't as sharp as high-speed steel, especially when you start adding things like coatings. Being aware of those two things, that it's brittle and potentially not as sharp, will go a long way to making your time with carbide much better than it did on your first date, and really will be the undercurrent of the rest of this video. So, enough of the technical mumbo-jumbo. Let's get down to brass tacks. Wait, not brass tacks. That's a different video. Let's get down to brazed carbide. You're looking at brazed carbide lathe tools. You can also get brazed carbide mill tooling, like face mills and stuff like that. They're called brazed carbide for a hopefully very apparent reason. It's a piece of carbide 
brazed to a steel shank. Since the tip is the only thing doing the cutting, it's much cheaper than a solid piece of carbide. Solid carbide tool holders exist, but they're another can of worms entirely. So brazed carbide isn't exactly the next step up between high-speed steel and insert tooling. Practically speaking, if you're new to this, skip brazed tooling altogether. I think that's a fair blanket statement to make. When I started out, I bought a lot of this stuff, especially the threading tools. It's magical carbide and it's cheaper and less of a commitment than insert tooling. But fact of the matter, I'd break it faster than I could buy it. Though with time and experience, I've come full circle and now in some cases, love using this stuff. But to get there, you have to play by its rules. In fact, I now often braze my own. I just take a piece of carbide and glue it to the end of a convenient support. This is the little undercut tool that I used in the coffee pot video. You can go back and see this thing being built. In this particular case, I think it was just one of these inserts I don't have a holder for. And I didn't even really need the properties of carbide, but it just made a convenient tool. I just needed to reach in there and do a little undercut in aluminum. If I couldn't do this, my option would have been to grind a heck of a lot of high-speed steel off of here to create this undercut. But brazed carbide finds a lot of uses down here in my garage. Here I used it to create scrapers. And again, it's either just raw carbide blank or some old insert I don't have a holder for. But if you buy the cheap brazed carbide, you know, that comes in those little kits of three or five in the fancy little plastic box, usually slathered in gold paint, you'll run into the same situation that I described back in the boring head video. This is a brazed carbide boring bar. And apart from the potential quality, or lack thereof, of the carbide, they're really just giving you a slug of carbide brazed to the end of a steel shank. It's up to you to check if the clearance and rake angles and sharpness and nose radii and all that kind of stuff is up to snuff. And with carbide, that's not necessarily as easy as high-speed steel. You're going to start to need special grinding wheels, the green silicon carbide, and then diamond honing tools to really finish that edge. Once you get there and you're comfortable with that, these things are spectacular. You can hone these to a sharper edge than you can insert tooling. Not because there's anything special about it, just the geometry is more conducive to that. You have big flat surfaces that are easy to hone instead of complicated little inserts with funny geometry and chip breakers and all that kind of stuff, though. You certainly could hone and resharpen your insert tooling if you really wanted to. Just like Stefan, carbide just wants to be treated right. If you try to make any fast moves, it'll get into a tizzy. Sorry, not a tizzy, that's Stefan. Carbide, just up and breaks. No way around it. You bump it, drop it, stop it while it's in the work, and it's Splitsville. Like we mentioned, it's brittle. And sharpening ain't so easy as high-speed steel. Well, technically, it'll sharpen in the same way, but it requires more stuff to do and takes longer because it's so hard. These tools want a nice, steady chip load, even if it is heavy, and no fast moves. They also don't enjoy intermittent cooling. So you either use them dry or you flood them. The thermal shock can crack these things. To some extent, that's gotten better over the years. But generally, either cut dry or flood them. They also don't like being in strong light, and you shouldn't feed them after midnight. But after all that, if you do want to buy this stuff, I mean, after all, it is cheaper than buying into insert tooling, get the good quality ones. They won't be as cheap as the imports, but you're much likely to have a lot better experience with them. Not to mention the good ones are usually ground and ready to go. And when it does come time to sharpen them, it's exactly the same geometry as we talked about in the high-speed steel video. All the same rules apply. Clearance angles, relief, nose radii. Grind them to suit the job you want them to do. And just a quick thought, this here is my ball turner. You may have seen this in the vice handle video. It uses a carbide tool bit. In this case, it's an old broken end mill. I like to make them myself. Now, although this thing is dull and has giant chips missing out of it, it's still a good source of carbide. So broken carbide end mills are a good source potentially for tooling. Hopefully you could see the end of that. It's just like the grind we put in the high speed steel in the last video. It's got some relief on the front, a little bit of back rake, and some radius corners. Now you could use these, for example, as inserts in homemade boring bars or I guess fly cutters. You could make reamers, countersinks, you know, sky's the limit. To make these more manageable, you'll likely want to cut them so you just have the shank. It gets a little bit tricky, but if you nick them a bit with a diamond wheel, like those little one inch or one and a half inch diamond wheels for rotary tools, like a Dremel tool, just nick it, put it in the vise, give it a sharp whack with a hammer, and it'll break. Like I said, this stuff is very brittle.
which, finally, takes us to the main subject of this video. Insert tooling. About time, too. Now, I thought about this for a minute, but don't think there's a real clear linear way to present this, so I'm just going to jump right in. There are, though, a few important things to keep in mind when getting into insert tooling. First, any one of them would work. Sure, there are a million different styles, shapes, colors, and flavors, but new, they all cut. The real question is usually which insert is best suited to what you'd like to do and the equipment you have. This is the part we'll probably talk about most. Second, the fundamental physics are identical to what we talked about in high-speed steel video. Clearance and rake, etc. They're exactly the same except someone else made them for you. You just want to be sure to pick the one that you need. And finally, probably the hardest one, try to get the good ones. I know they're expensive, but in the long run you'll save time, frustration, and probably money. Trust me, I threw more money away at the cheap import junk than I care to think about. Probably the single most popular question people have is where I get my nails done. A close second, however, is which inserts I use and which I'd recommend. Now, I think I've mentioned this before, but almost all of my insert tooling for the lathe is scavenged. I mean, either I got it with the lathe, found it at flea markets, Craigslist kind of stuff. And what I have, to be honest, is actually a bit big for my lathe. But these are the sizes I run into most, and therefore tend to be the cheapest. So, frankly, that's what I use. They're not optimal for my use, but they work, and the price is right for me. So no particular order, let's jump in. First, you'd want to get something that's suited to the size of your lathe. These two holders and insert styles are exactly the same, but they're two different sizes. These happen to be WNMG inserts, but we'll get to that in a minute. On the right, the one in gold, is the one I use probably 90% of the time. Of the inserts that I find most, I like the WNMGs. Again, they're probably not the best match for what I do, but of the ones I find, these are the ones I like. This on the right was given to me. Brian Barker of Newfangled Solutions of the Mach 3 and Mach 4 fame got a hold of me not long ago, told me he enjoyed what I was producing, and wanted to send me a few things. And he was kind enough to send an industrial license for Mach 4, a pendant, and the tool holder you see there on the right. He sent me that tool holder along with two style inserts that fit that holder, but we'll get a closer look at that shortly. For anyone who's interested, I do have plans to do a part three of the CNC Basics video, and I've slowly been migrating to Mach 4, so we'll have a closer look at that there. I guess he must have noticed that I use this style of insert a lot, and that's why he sent me this style. Again, I didn't ask for it specifically, though he did ask what size shank I preferred. And you can see my tooling tends to be big because, again, that's what I find. But that leads to some other, I don't want to call them problems, but considerations on the lathe. I need a larger tool post to accommodate the larger tooling. That gets a little bit more overhang, makes my setup sometimes a little less rigid. Ideally, my lathe would use about this size tooling. But the first thing you'll likely notice is they come in a ton of shapes. In fact, shape happens to be the first letter in the insert designation. So we'll walk through the standard designation one code at a time, and when we're through, well, that should do it. I will make some recommendations at the end. And before we get into shapes, one last thought on holders. Unless you only use your tooling once a year and do very light cuts, maybe on small parts, it pays to get a good quality holder. The holders are expensive. Cheap holders are just that. They're cheap. They'll slowly wear out and won't hold the insert firmly. Unless your screw strips right out, which they usually do, you might not guess that the holder is causing your problems. Ah. Uh... Fiddlesticks. I can't believe you folks just let me go on and on like that with a broken insert in the shot. I am so embarrassed. I guess that's what I get for manhandling the tooling on the table the way I've been doing it. Hey, Bri, if you're out there, my apologies. I mean, that was the first cutting edge I tried, and I'll be honest, this past week I've been putting this insert through heck and back, just seeing what it could do. And that edge, I mean, it was holding up like a champ. I couldn't throw material at this thing fast enough. And then I done gone and chipped it here on the bench. So earlier I mentioned insert designation. Insert designations are basically the standard naming convention for machining inserts. In this case, we'll be looking at lathe inserts, and in my case, the WNMG. I mentioned the first letter specifies the shape. The W in this example refers to what's called a trigon shape. The second letter is the clearance angle. The N here is zero degrees and means that this insert has zero or no clearance. Now keep in mind this is not the rake angle. This is the side relief. Zero degrees, the side is square with the top. The third letter is the tolerance. 
it basically means that the insert is made to within two to five thousandths of industry specifications. The fourth and final letter is the hole and chip breaker style. G means the insert has a cylindrical hole and that there's a chip breaker on each side. After that four letter designation, there are usually three sets of two numbers. This particular insert is an 080408. The first pair of numbers refers to the size of the insert, or the inscribed circle. 08 in this case is 8 millimeters. The next pair of numbers is the thickness. 04 again in this case is 4 millimeter thick insert. And the last pair of numbers call out the nose radius. Again here 08 means 0 0.8 millimeters. Like I said this code is standard for lathe tools. Milling is a little bit different, but check online for the decoder ring and it's usually pretty easy to work out. I most often look this stuff up on carbidedepot.com, but you'll find that each supplier and manufacturer will have a similar document that breaks down the code names for you. Let's have a quick simplified look at what shape means, like what the implications are of the different shapes. We'll look at five styles for now, round, square, trigon, triangular, and 55 degree diamond. The round one here might not actually be a turning insert, but it's the only roundish one I have to show you. These are sometimes called button inserts. Round is the strongest shape insert and leaves some of the best finishes around. However, you can't turn sharp inside corners with them. They are popular on CNC lathes though for turning funny shaped contours. Next strongest is square, but because they're square, they don't have clearance to leave good sharp inside corners. They'd likely chatter and are usually used at 45 degrees for turning, facing, and chamfering all in one tool. Next in my lineup is the Trigon. It has an 80 degree included angle that gives it 5 degrees per side in a shoulder and can do both turning and facing. Trigons, however, I believe always have negative rake. Next are the popular triangles. They work just like the Trigons, though a little weaker, but instead they do come in positive rake, and in that variant they only have three cutting tips. We'll cover that next. And finally here I have a 55 degree diamond. These give you access into finer features. I'm really getting to like these, but with positive rake, they only have two cutting tips. Now, there are a lot more than these five I'm showing you, but hopefully you're starting to get the picture. That brings us to the tool holder itself. Holder and insert are intimately related. Let's compare the WNMG setup on the left with the DCMT on the right. According to the second letter in their insert designations, the WNMG has no clearance and the DCMT has seven degrees. Again, the N was zero degrees, and the C in the DCMT tells us that it's seven. As we saw in the high-speed steel video, you need clearance for a tool to cut properly, and here's where the holder comes in. The WNMG holder on the left, in this case, has a built-in five degree negative rake. It sort of by nature holds the insert at sort of a five degree downward angle. This gives the WNMG five degree of clearance sort of on the front and the sides and also changes its effective rake angle on the top. The rake being that five degrees plus or minus whatever the manufacturer actually built into the top of the insert itself. The DCMT on the right, however, has a flat seat in the holder. It's adding nothing to the insert geometry. So all the clearance and rake is built into the insert itself. If you wanna build your own insert holders, these are the type of inserts to look for. So again, the insert and the holder work together to create the final cutting geometry. Now that geometry leads to some interesting implications. Because the DCMT has sort of built-in clearance, and in this case happens to be a positive rake insert, we can get two cutting edges out of this insert. If you flip it around, that seven degrees is now going the wrong way for this insert to work. The WNMG, on the other hand, because it has no side clearance, it's completely square. Now, because of the shape, it's given us three cutting edges to begin with, three cutting tips, as opposed to two for the diamond. But like we said, this has the advantage of being able to get into some tighter spaces. But this tool now can be made symmetric. So if you flip it, there are another three cutting edges. So the short story is, this has two cutting tips, and this has six. Let's throw a couple more in here for discussion sake. This I think is a milling insert on the left. This has some very high positive rake. So you can see flipping it over wouldn't do much good in terms of getting more cutting edges. But because it's square, it's got four. The DCMT, because of its shape, only has two. But you can't really compare the two. They're for two different jobs. This I believe is a CCMT. It's also a diamond shape but has a larger included angle. Because of the high positive rake on this, it also only provides two cutting edges. The back is flat. 
And finally, there's a triangular insert. I, these go in my boring bars. The boring bar that I use this in has a negative rake. The effective rake of the entire tool is negative. And so this gives me twice the cutting edges. Just like the negative WNMG, one insert in either of these styles gets me six cutting tips for the same price of the insert. And since we've gotten all up close and personal with these inserts while we're here, have a look at all the different chip breaker geometries, the different styles. Each manufacturer has more or less their own flavor of them, and they're built to work with specific materials at specific speed and feed rates. Usually if you're trying to buy this stuff from a rep, you might not be spitting off clearance and relief angles that you want and tool holder styles. You'd probably tell them, you know, what the job looks like that you wanted to do, what the material is, and what machine you have. At which point the rep would likely pull out, you know, their cutting tool from the future with lasers and shark teeth and leave it with you and send the invoice to somebody else. So let's give one of these a try. Since I mostly use WNMGs, and this tool that Brian sent, being the only one with pedigree papers, we'll try this one out on the lathe. I'd also like to give it some air time to thank him for sending it, to be honest. Now, it's not my intention to plug this tool per se, as it might not be the right tool for you. But for the beginner, the way I see it, you have two options. If you're trying to save money, let's be honest, you'll probably check like eBay or Craigslist and do all of your own homework. If you have a small lathe, the usual recommendation, I believe, is like a CCMT or a TCMT. Choose one for the material you use most, but have a look online. Maybe someone's already done some experimenting and can tell you what they think works best for your particular machine. Option two, the low hassle approach, is to call a reseller or a manufacturer. Now, being a hobbyist and only wanting to buy one tool doesn't really work to your advantage here. But if you want to talk to Brian, it's my understanding that they're targeting the hobby crowd they only want to sell you one or two inserts. Now this particular tool, this is a Kenna Metal, in this specific size costs about $90. That's just the tool holder. The inserts, if I'm not mistaken, at the time of this video are about $17 each. Now they do have six cutting tips, so in my case it comes out to, I don't know, two or three dollars per tip. Now, Brian told me that this tip will last me forever, so joke's on you, Brian. I plan to use this forever. If you get this through them, I think I'll put a link up on the screen. I think it's Maniac's Tool Crib. Included in that price is sort of some technical support for the tool, a little bit of hand-holding on their part. So if you call them up, tell them what machine and material you're trying to cut, they'll help you pick a tool, send you the tool. I believe they include a spec sheet for the inserts, so you'll already know the feeds and speeds and, you know, all the parameters the tool is designed to run at. So Brian sent me two inserts for the same tool holder. The one on the left here is a little bit sharper, but I think it wants a minimum depth of cut of like, I don't know, 8 to 10 thou, 15 thou. Whereas the one on the right, according to the spec sheet, won't start to break chips till about 30 thou depth of cut. So if you needed to take off just 1 or 2 or 3 thou, you know, depending on your machine, more than likely, in that case, you'd switch to a very, very sharp, high-speed steel, sort of home-ground tool. So as I mentioned, I've been playing around with the coarser of the two inserts in some chromoly. I think it's chromoly, 4150. I think this is the same stuff. It was doing a spectacular job. I don't know if you guys saw any of my other videos with this chromoly, but my other insert got a lot of bird's nesting, and this is breaking off in nice... You know, not discrete chips, but these little noodles. I was able to push it up to about a 50 thou depth of cut before my lathe started choking out. In this material, though, it wasn't actually chip breaking till about 35, 40 thou, at least at the feed rate I was using. I don't know if you can see those depth of cuts. But what I'd actually like to do is try the finer insert, the one with the FF2 chip breaker, I think, and just see what kind of surface finishes and chips I can get with the carbide. Again, if you go back and you look at the taper tooling video, the surface finish is good, but it's not like, you know, spectacular. Again, the inserts that I use, if I'm not mistaken, they might be Mitsubishi, and for all I know, like I say, I scavenge them, they might be for cast iron. But they move material, so keeps me happy. So let me load this up and we'll see what that finer insert does. So I'm gonna run and lay that 1200 RPM, and that's the max this machine will do. I'm only going to be taking 10 or 15 thou depths of cuts with this insert. And I'm going to be running at the slowest feed rate I have. Which on this machine I believe is about 7 or 8 thou. See how it does. 
I'm starting out with a 10 thou depth of cut. I just more really want to clean this up just so subsequent passes are actually taking on a consistent chip load. Well, I'll do 10, 15, maybe we'll push it to 20, see what happens. So I don't know if you can see that, but it's a spectacular finish. I can sort of see a rainbow of colors in that. It wasn't breaking chips though. Let's try 15. This will be 20. Once I actually dial it in, it'll be 20. Let's go to 30. So 30 actually was breaking chips. I picked up a little cluster there that ruined my surface finish. I'm going to try 35. keeps picking up that initial chip, but it's chip breaking spectacularly. Let me try that 35 again. Man, this chromoly stinks. I'm going to up my feed rate, but drop this back down to 15. So I'm really happy with how that turned out. I don't have enough space here to show you the chips. The chips are beautiful. Surface finish is perfect. The work actually seems a little bit cooler than my old inserts, but that's maybe a depth of cut thing. At any rate, I think that's about all I had to say for carbide inserts for now anyway. Here's hoping you found that useful. And until next time, thanks for watching. Ch -ch -ch carbide.